Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is my favorite topic, um, or one of them, I should say. Um, I really love uh, talking about neuroscience, um, and I think it's fascinating to learn about the neurons and how they work, and then um, how that translates to neurotransmission and so forth. Um, and so this is one of my favorite things. Um, you're going to have this lecture, and then there's lots of videos underneath. A few of them I say, hey, great, watch this. Um, Definitely watch the first one. I'll show you all of the steps I'm going to talk about. And then the one with Michael J. Fox on his Parkinson's disease, I think is really interesting. Um, and then the one that talks about how um, sodium potassium ions actually switch places. So I think those are pretty good. But um, take a look, um, and um, those will help you um, illustrate things that I'm talking about anyway. And they would have, I would have shown those in class as well. OK, so let's get started. What is a neuron? So um, neurons are those building blocks of your brain. And even though glial cells make up most of your brain, um, the neurons uh, are the ones that are so functional um, and so forth. And there's 86 billion of them. And they go, you know, 270 miles per hour. We get the, all this, um, as I'm talking, all of that's happening in my brain, which is pretty amazing. Um, the longest uh, neuron we have in our body, the longest, is three feet long, and it goes um, from your brain to your big toe, or just about, um, and um, it's pretty amazing how long uh, that is. Um, so a neuron is what is going to um, take up and process and transmit information. Um, it's electrical. Um, but definitely chemical. Uh, the chemical signal is that neurotransmitter that comes um, out of the axon terminal. Um, and it's for us to react to our um, own environment. So for an example of that would be if you were to touch your hand on a hot pot, um, you're going to pull it away. Well, the whole part of that is that you have neurons that are giving this signal, um, this ascending signal, where on the tip of your finger, there is sensory receptors that are um, going to pick up that um, stimulus, that stimulus of touch and pain. That ascending is going to go up to your brain, and then the descending neurons are going to be moving the motor neurons, and that's going to pull your, your finger off. Now included in that is we have the spinal reflex. So instead of um, the, uh, it might have happened like really, really fast, so instead of me just saying, okay, now I'm going to wiggle my fingers, like that there was an, an ascending to my brain saying that you know I want to move, move my fingers and now I'm moving my fingers right um, but sometimes it's like a dangerous thing and we need for our body to respond um, a lot quicker so think about the last time that you cut your finger okay when you cut your finger don't, isn't there like a pause like there isn't um, sometimes like you don't feel the pain right away there's a delay in pain well that's because the, the pain that you feel, you're going to pull yourself away from that pain, and that's coming from your spinal um, cord, and it's a reflex that you have. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, and then all of a sudden, then you get the, uh, the sensory receptors going up to your brain, going out, there's pain, and down, and then you actually feel the pain. Okay, so that's why there's a delay, because the initial is that spinal reflex, and then it registers, okay? So, and that makes a lot of sense of why that happens. Um, so that's what ascending and descending neurons are. Okay, this is the basic um, structure of a neuron. You need to know this. Um, so starting on the left-hand side, you see the dendrites, okay? And the dendrites are, are going to receive the messages. And right next to a dendrite is a terminal button, as you see on the right-hand side of this um, diagram. It's a terminal button from the last or the pre um, synaptic neuron, and if this is the postsynaptic, then there's something before that, right? There's a, an axon terminal right next to those dendrites, okay? And that's where those neurotransmitters are going in. And you have the soma and the nucleus, and nucleus has DNA in it, just like any other cell. And then that long white area is the um, axon, and the white that you see is the myelin sheath that's making that um, uh, electrical message go a lot faster. And then you see the buttons, they look, and they look like that on, I'll show you um, on the uh, a microscope, they look circular like that. And that is, and each one of those buttons are little circles that are called vesicles, and that's going to hold all your neurotransmitters. Okay, so you need to know the basic uh, parts of the neuron. It's actually on um, a microscope, and you can see the soma, it's that circular area, 
and the dendrites kind of coming out of it and a long axon. And then even at, all the way to the left-hand side, you can see that little terminal button. And then out to the, and um, in the background there, you can see more somas and they're, um, they're, it looks like kind of more like a, a spider web, but that is uh, those uh, dendrites coming out of the soma, okay? Okay, what are the three types of neurons? Well, we have sensory, and that's what I talked about before. Anything like the pain on my finger, if I'm touching something hot, that touch, okay? Anything sensory, if I'm seeing light, if I'm hearing sound and taste, all those things. Um, and that's our set, what our chapter three is going to be about, is sensory and how you're um, all those senses work, okay? Um, so sensory neurons are going to be those that are picking up um, what's going on in the environment. And that may lead to a motor neuron actually um, doing something. So if I'm touching something hot, then that sensory receptor that's in my finger is going to have it re um, received to my brain, and then the motor neuron is going to make me um, pull um, my hand away. Now, most of our neurons, though, are those interneurons, the ones that are going to communicate between a sensory and a motor neuron. And you can see most of them have all of the, in the picture there, all of the similar parts of a neuron, but you can see the motor neuron looks like the one that we see a diagram most of. Okay, so those are the three. And then what is neurotransmission? So neurotransmission is when two neurons or more are, and that's what happens all the time, two or more neurons are communicating with each other. Um, and this is what's going to create all of our actions, but not only just our actions, but our thoughts and emotions. And it can be individual and in, in, um, entirety, but it can also, we have a lot of things in common because we're human beings. So for instance, the root between our eyes and our visual cortex, so our visual cortex is in the back here. Um, and it's one of the things that helps us dream. Okay, so our eyes are a functional part of our, um, of our anatomy. And then the visual cortex is going to help us sort of like have that perception of what we're actually seeing and so forth. That's programmed when we're um, with genes and, um, <coughs> excuse me, forms uh, before birth. And that's for everyone. New pathways are constantly being um, built throughout our entire life, but especially when you're an infant. Um, and there's always those connections. So that's why we talked about um, a baby who is born, their brain mass will grow almost 90% in three months because there's so much going on and they get so much input and it's growing um, neurons and actually and then uh, brain mass. So one of the things that babies will do is first, you know, they learn movement and senses and then they learn language and rational thinking, okay? So you can see if you've um, ever seen an infant, they'll all of a sudden like bump into their hand and their face and they go, oh, I have hands and fingers and they'll, they'll stare at their hand and like, you know, they think it's amazing. They'll stare at their hand for hours and like see how it moves and so forth. And then they start to find feet and they start putting their feet in their, in their mouths and stuff. So they discover all this movement and like how they can move their arms and, and how what things happen, cause and effect. You know, it'd be weird for a baby to come out and start talking and be like, hey, mom. Um, so language is going to come later um, and then rational thinking, of course, after that. So we always uh, will be talking about in the remainder of the year, how all those experiences that you have make com uh, continual connections in your brain um, and they become very efficient and then that can grow brain mass. So when we talk about how neurotransmission works, we want to use these particular vocabulary words. So we have action potential, resting potential, stimulus threshold, refractory period, depolarization, and repolarization. So normally we do this in class and say, hey, we, you know, explain that to a partner. So we're going to be, um, you can think about it for a minute, pause and see if you could use that. And then I'll, I'll tell you the answer right now. Okay, so neurons, this is the process of, of neurotransmission. I am not a biology teacher, so I really, <coughs> excuse me, try to break it down so that you would understand it just like I understand it with using technical terms as well, okay? So a neuron is just sitting alone, okay? It's polarized, it's in its resting state, so it's in its resting potential and it's ready to fire. Then what happens is another neuron has sent some information and is now charged up that neuron and it has to be enough, it has to be a minimal level in which for it to have that stimulation and that's called stimulus threshold. So the minimum level of stimulation, sorry, stimulation um, that it has is going to get that action potential moving, okay? So it has to have a certain amount in order if it's an all or nothing, um, or the neuron does not fire. So that electrical impulse um, then 
is caused from the rushing in and out, as you read in your, in your textbook, of potassium and sodium, potassium and sodium, and this sort of wave action that kind of goes down the axon. The first video I have um, act, that's a, uh, on Canvas will show you that. It'll show you this, all these electrical charges kind of moving around, and then you'll see positive and negative um, ions. And there's another video that will show you how those gateways actually open and close um, to move those ions, um, potassium and, and um, sodium ions, in and out. But it basically does this kind of wave action down in segments, okay? When it does that, and potassium is um, now on the inside, and I'm sorry, sodium's on the inside and potassium's on the outside, that movement like that is called depolarization. In the resting potential, it's polarized, and then when we move those that charge around, it's depolarized, which makes sense. Okay, and then the action potential, it is, and that word association is not, it's not potential, it's just moving. It's, it's actually the actual racing across the axon, that electrical impulse that we call. And it's not necessarily electrical, it's more um, of that movement that's uh, potential, the potential for it for, to do that. Um, and then it degenerates along the axon because it's moving like a wave. So each time the segment goes, then it's degenerating. It's like this is the top, the front of the axon, and then about the end it's degenerated and that all that has gone back into place again. So um, be careful with that word association. The refractory period is when those sodium potassium regroup and go back um, to its original place with sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside. So it's repolarized. And then we're back to resting potential and we're ready to fire again. Okay, so that's the breakdown of neurotransmission. We still have to add on um, what's going on in the synapse, but we'll do that in, in, a, in a minute. So specifically, let's break down what it looks like to what we show the role of sodium and potassium ions. And you can see the sodium is the purple dots on that um, picture and the um, potassium is the inside and it's green. So neuron, when it's at rest, the sodium is on the outside positive and the, um, of the cell body and the potassium is on the inside and it's negatively charged at negative 70 millivolts. And that is what we call resting potential. The neuron is no longer at rest then when the sodium ions, they get, um, there's a charge and something's happening with the neuron and it causes, um, because that charge is coming in, it causes the sodium and the potassium to want to switch places. Okay, now, now not all of the sodium and potassium are, are changing places, just some of them. Okay, and that rushing in and out of the axon uh, body is what's going to create that charge and have it rush across um, the axon. The charge then in the inside when this happens is positive as those ions move and now it's going to be plus 30 millivolts. Okay, and there's a video there for you to, um, to look at that really shows you how amazing this is. I mean, there is gateways that open for both and then there's a sodium pump and it happens for every neuron that you have all the time, um, which is a pretty amazing thing that your, your body does. So what is the role of myelin sheath? And then we're going to look at oogodendrocytes and um, swan cells. So the myelin sheath is that white covering, and it's the fatty um, covering over the axons that makes that message go faster. One thing that can happen, and I do have a video that explains this as well, but one thing that happens to the um, if you get MS or multiple sclerosis is that your myelin sheath starts to degenerate. When that happens, messages kind of get interrupted and things are not happening and that's when you get neurological issues. One of the first things that happens with people with MS is they start getting tingliness um, in their extremities and so forth because things are not firing as well and, and those muscles are feeling kind of weird. Um, the next thing that will happen is that you'll, you'll see someone um, will get very clumsy. Their reaction time, they'll drop something or if they drop something, they, they don't retrieve it um, and their reaction time is very slow. And because the reaction time is slow, you can see the messages along the motor neurons are not working as well. And that's why they start to drop things like that, okay? Um, as you can see, there's effective areas there um, of the brain, spinal cord, senses, digestive system, muscles, um, everything, mouth, mouth, mouth and speech, you know, some of that will start to, to go and so forth, okay? Okay, now glial cells. Glial cells are important. You can see that they're um, where they are on that, um, diagram that I have 
um, oligodendrocytes, you'll see them attached to some of the axons. The swan cells make up the myelin sheath and so forth. Um, and so they play an important role as they are um, part of um, a neuron on the outside, right? And they don't um, have the same function as that, but they're uh, working together. Um, glial cells, most of the cells in your brain um, are glial cells. That has the most of all. Even though there's a lot of neurons, there's more glial cells, okay? And there's different types of them. They were thought not to be as important, but people have found that they really communicate um, chemically with one another and they respond to infections, they glue tissue development or guides tissue development, sorry, and support learning and memory um, and so forth and can mimic activities um, of neurons as well. So they're very, very important as they've learned. Most common types, we have astrocytes, uh, which are your star shaped cells. They're going to provide nutrients to tissue and they're going to help to repair neurons. So astrocytes are um, really important when it comes to neurogenesis and plasticity that you'll you'll hear about in section three um, and um, trying to regenerate if there's brain uh, damage. Um, oligodendrocytes uh, are in the brain and swan is the rest of the nervous system and they are octopus shaped um, uh, and so and they coat axons with myelin. And then microglia are really important. They remove waste or dead um, neurons. You actually shed neurons when you don't use them. Um, and that is not because you are getting slow. It's if you get really fast at something, those particular neurons that are um, in with that function, they're going to get really much faster and more efficient. And then you kind of weed away the ones that you're not using. Um, one of the things that happens as a teenager um, you've been building neurons and building neurons as you get um, older and older. And then as you become a teenager, you actually start, there's a period where you shed some of your neurons um, and make things more efficient um, and so forth. And then, of course, when you're older, that tends to happen just because you are getting older. So neurons can die and the microglia will take care of um, all that access, uh, like weight and dead tissue and so. Okay, so let's talk about the other side of neurotransmission. We've gotten what's happening at the beginning through the axon, and then let's go to the terminal buttons. And there you see a picture of one terminal button, and you can see the electrical charge kind of coming down into it. And then you'll see the circular vesicles, and in the vesicles are those neurotransmitters, okay? And so then what happens at the synaptic gap or the synapse, where you see that space in between the terminal button and the postsynaptic uh, neuron. So once that impulse reaches that, those uh, vesicles get a, a message to move down to the end, and you can see it there, and then start releasing neurotransmitters, okay? And they cross that tiny space. So watch that video, it's really cool, and it shows you exactly what it would look like for them to go in. Now, you can see on the postsynaptic neuron, there are receptors, and those are really important because the neurotransmitters will fit into those receptors. Now, let's say it's dopamine, right? Well, dopamine has a specific receptor that it's going to go into, and there's only so many dopamine receptors, even though that looks pretty like, oh, there's only one uh, for these particular neurotransmitters. There's, there's tons of them there, um, and they are going to fit specifically into those dopamine receptors, and then that's going to be passed along, okay? If it doesn't fit in, if there's no room for it, it's going to stay in that synaptic gap, and that's when you get reuptake, okay? Uh, into the presynaptic uh, neuron, the one that it was coming from, all right? So I almost like talking about receptors like when you were a kid and you had that big canister of wooden blocks and you were trying to figure out which shape went in the top, you know, like the circle and the square and the triangle. That's kind of what those receptors are like. It has a specific fit um, for those neurotransmitters. Okay, so the role of a neurotransmitter is to uh, is that chemical messenger. It's what's going to get the next neuron going. Okay, and they're very very small, um, and these chemicals are released uh, from one end of the neuron. And it crosses a synapse, as you can see there on that microscopic um, picture, um, and it goes into the next neuron. Okay, and then when those neurons are not um, used or um, taken up from the receptor, it's broken down again and re and reabsorbed, which is what we call reuptake. Very fancy name, reuptake. Okay, now there's different types of, of, of synapses, okay? Um, the postsynaptic um, neuron might fire or it might prevent firing. It depends on the type of synapse that you have. So a synapse can be excitatory, which means it wants to promote firing, 
or it could be inhibitory on that neuron, and that means that it wants to reduce a something in the body and it starts to block it. Okay, so there's two of that. Um, and we're going to talk about drugs being that way too. Agonist and antagonist drugs can work the same way as those synapses can as well. Okay, so let's talk about neurotransmitters. These are really important um, to uh, the whole process of what is actually going on in your body. So this first one, everybody has a really hard time pronouncing always, but it's acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the most common neurotransmitter, and that's because it has a lot of our basic muscular functions and, and autotomic uh, functions. So that is anything that's automatic, not an uh, a voluntary, but an involuntary movement. It also deals with learning and memory. A lot of them do. Um, and the way that we kind of talk about this was in like World War I when they had yellow mustard gas in the trenches. Um, if you didn't get your ma gas mask on, you would get and you would hail in this sarin gas, this yellow gas, and people would seize up, it would get really rigid muscles. And that was because it was affecting their acetylcholine. Okay. Okay, dopamine, and we know is sort of this happy and it, it's involved in mood, but it has a lot of other functions as well. Um, and that is uh, regulatory, it's, it regulates motor activity, which is why it's involved, and you can see Michael J. Fox is above me, um, and watch that video, why it's involved in Parkinson's disease if you have too little of it, okay? Um, it can, in, in that middle stage, it's sort of like that mood, sensory perception one, um, attention can be at that as well. If it gets too little, then we start getting into a disease. It's a chemical imbalance. Too little Parkinson's could happen, um, especially if you have a gene for it. And then too much dopamine can create um, overactivity um, and schizophrenia um, uh, symptoms, okay? So that can, that's what we call a chemical imbalance. Chemical imbalances can also be with hormones as well. Okay, norepinephrine and epinephrine as two that we'll talk about. Norepinephrine is involved in heartbeat and arousal, um, learning and memory retrieval. If you have too much, you get too much anxiety. You know, if it's going with heart rate and arousal, too much arousal is anxiety. Too little, you can get depression as, as well as dopamine. If you have too little, um, you can that mood can shift um, as well, and uh, mental disorders are um, associated with both. Glutamate is an excitatory uh, transmitter and it excites 90% of, of the brain. So it plays um, a big role in learning and memory. If you have too much, you can cause too much overactivity and you can have seizures. Um, and then a malfunction will be with, with Alzheimer's where you start forgetting. So learning and memory, it's not exciting the brain enough and you've slowed it down and then we start getting um, degeneration and Alzheimer's. Uh, epinephrine is the opposite of nor, or it works together, excuse me, with uh, norepinephrine, um, and it's known as adrenaline. So you'll hear the book talk about it in both ways, epinephrine or, or adrenaline, it's the same thing. And that's our fight or flight system. That's the um, neurotransmitter that kind of gets revved up when we know we're in a um, dangerous situation or some kind of emergency. And then endorphins are another one, and that they deal with stress, okay? So they get turned on when we're in a stressful situation so we can make it through, like trauma. Um, pain, so we have a re pain receptions down when endorphins are up. You know, that's why when people are in um, car accidents and things like that, they end up lifting cars and because their endorphins get them there. That's what happens with exercise, Why? and that's why um, they're involved in mood, and that's why exercise is important. Um, and then they get overstimulated with opioids. So if you take an opioid, um, it will stimulate endorphins, and that's where you get that really big rush and so forth. Okay, other neurotransmitters, serotonin. Um, besides mood, we dop dopamine and serotonin sort of talked about in the same way. They have other functions. So this one's attention and very complex cognitive functions. Um, it also deals with sleep and dreaming, eating, uh, and so forth. And the reason why um, it's with eating, if you look at where neurons with serotonin are distributed, they're in the brain, stomach, and spinal cord. So neurotransmitters, with the neurons that have those neurotransmitters in them, okay, not all neurons have serotonin in them. It just depends on where it's placed in the body, okay? So dopamine centers of your brain, which tend to be in the middle of your brain, um, those are the neurons that have dopamine in them, okay? So that's sort of how it works. And then serotonin is in your brain, your stomach, and your spinal cord. So if, it's in, if those neurons are in your stomach, that kind of makes sense that eating is associated with it, you know what I mean? Um, and then that's also obviously a, uh, 
associated with mood disorders. If you have low serotonin, you can um, get personality disorders or uh, depression. And it has a very calming effect, so it can bring somebody down from um, being overly excited um, and, and anxiety. And then GABA is the most important inhibitory. So it's one of our ones that blocks things. So it stops the brain from becoming overexcited and kind of dampens um, brain activity. Of course, if you have too much of it, um, you can get uh, hallucinations. Um, and so they get that, again, that chemical imbalance. So when we look at um, the last things is about drugs um, and how all of this works together with agonist and antagonist drugs. So one thing about these two is that you can't use word association with these. An agonist drug uh, triggers a response. It wants something to happen in the body. I kind of think an, an, an antagonist sounds like that, like I'm trying to prod you. You can't use that though because, and this happens every year, everybody, uh, a lot of people get this wrong um, because they're trying to use word association. An antagonist drug is blocking a response from the body. So it's not like you would think of trying to agitate, okay? So the way I think of antagonists is an, an antagonist in a story is an evil person and you don't want them, okay? That's how I remember that, all right? So let's look at how this works in action, okay? So, so these are different examples of how um, receptors and neurotransmitters and all that kind of work. And you'll kind of get it as I go through these, these quick examples. So first of all, the venom of a black widow spider. If you are bitten by a black widow spider, it causes acetylcholine to be released continuously. That's that one that does with our muscles and our motor. So our motor neurons, then you start getting muscle spasms um, and so forth. So you need something to counteract to block the acetylcholine from being recepted too much, okay? Um, and so you can see how that kind of works um, with everything that we've talked about. Okay, let's look at another example. So things like Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, those are all antidepressant me medications. Um, they're called SSRIs. If you look at it, you know almost all the words there. They are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're trying to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. Okay, and you're like, well, I thought serotonin was great. It was a good thing, you know, that would help somebody who's being antidepressed. But listen, if you are blocking the reuptake, that means that in that syn synapse, that serotonin will stay there. It's not going to be reabsorbed. It's going to then eventually be pushed along into another neuron, which would then create more serotonin in the system, okay? And that's a good thing for people who are depressed, okay? All right, and then let's talk about something like cocaine. So cocaine interferes with the reuptake of dopamine. So on the opposite side, where we don't want this to happen, okay, Dopamine is going to be the same way that that reuptake, um, serotonin reuptake in Paxil and, and um, Zoloft and so forth. Um, cocaine actually um, interferes with the reuptake of dopamine, so you get more dopamine and the rush of the drug makes you feel like you're happy and, you know, like more elevated um, than you normally would be. Now, this is the really important part about drug and drug abuse, okay? If you look on that diagram there, you see all those receptors. When somebody is a drug abuser, their body eventually will create more receptors for dopamine, for instance, okay, if it's cocaine, let's say, okay? So they create more receptors. So that is the reason why people who are drug abusers, it takes so long to go through rehab because they have physically affected their um, neurons and created more receptors. Okay, and that's the danger of taking drugs over a long period of time or taking them continuously because you could alter your, uh, your neurons and create receptors. With that being the case, then it, the person does want the drug to fill up those receptors because your body is physically wanting um, those receptors to be filled with more dopamine. Okay, and they need the drug in order to do that. Your body's not going to naturally do it. You have to take the drug to do it. So that's why it takes so long for rehab and you have to physically take away the drug for those receptors to change and rewire and actually go away. And that's the hard part. So we have to be really careful about drug, drug use. Okay, nicotine is an, an example of an agonist drug where it binds to the receptor and it's gonna stimulate, okay, um, muscles and heart 
rate and so forth. Okay, so it's going to occupy that nicotine is going to occupy a receptor and cause a stimulation uh, in muscle and um, heart rate. Okay, and then the example of an antagonist drug that's going to block is our nioxin, who is used for overdoses for opioids. They use this. And what it does is a person has overdosed on an opioid, which happens a lot these days, unfortunately. They, uh, they give this injection, and that drug is going to fill those receptor sites and block the drug from going anywhere into a receptor so that person does not overdose um, and die, okay? So it blocks um, for opioids, especially it's uh, endorphins. We, we just talked about that. Um, and so it reverses effects of heroin and, and oxycodone and things like that. Okay, now when we look at things like uh, the effects of marijuana, so marijuana binds to receptors which are responsible for mood, memory, appetite, pain, emotions, and so forth, and then it releases dopamine and decreases the actions of GABA. Um, so you get real chill, you know, there's not, uh, it's not exciting. Um, what about ecstasy or speed? So it blocks the reuptake pumps for certain neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, so this is going to increase energy and have a, um, it's going to have more of those serotonin, epinephrine, and dopamine. And if you think about it, all three of those, you're, that's why it's speed, right? You're going to increase energy and a feeling of euphoria because the reuptake's not happening and all of that's being flooded into your body, okay? And then lastly, um, like LSD, shrooms, peyote, things like that, um, they react with serotonin uh, receptors to create a similar effect. So it's going to um, also affect the way the retina processes information and, and, conduct, in the, and uh, conduct in the brain. So you start seeing hallucinations, um, but it can also cause tremors, uh, sweating, and uncontrolled blood pressure because you're, you're messing with that serotonin. It's bringing more serotonin in or mimicked serotonin into the system.